Hello, everyone. Uh, just want to say, as a, as a Providence-born girl, it's really wonderful to be a part of this exhibition, uh, first and foremost. And I'm really honored to have some, some old uh, friends and, and professors here uh, to, uh, to be present for this uh, wonderful opening. Uh, secondly, I just also wanted to say, as I was driving here from New York, I was listening to an interview of Robert Caro and how he uh, wrote his book, The Power Broker, and his uh, volumes on Lyndon Johnson. And one of his uh, recommendations, as he's now written a, a new book on his own uh, research style, uh, his advice was to turn every page. And I do believe that uh, Elizabeth has, uh, and, and, and all, all who are involved here have done their very best to turn every page and uh, turn every stone uh, to produce a really, really beautiful exhibition. So, uh, Exceedingly Splendid uh, comes from <coughs> a, 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 um, an article in Harper's New Monthly Magazine, and I'll just give you the whole quote. The appearance of a dinner table set with silver for a large party is so exceedingly beautiful that we can hardly wonder that fashion has adopted this metal for her own. Show me the way a people dine, and I will tell you their rank among civilized beings. <laughs> And then, <laughs> well, we'd be like the wild men of Borneo. <laughs> so, um, uh, in this, in this uh, short, short time we have, I'd like to just talk about the way in which design and function and the social role of silver has uh, affected the, the domestic realm, how it's affected some gender roles. Uh, the rising importance of the wedding and society and how uh, the accoutrements of the wedding carries over into, into family life. And of course, all forms of prescriptive literature to help those who are in desperate need of advice as to how to go about doing these things. Uh, and in fact, for, for a time, American silver was really the most desirable medium for expressing gentility, sophistication, and wealth. And Gorham saw it to meet the desires and aspirations of their consumers, even as they also helped to shape that evolving nature of silver consumption itself. So I'd like to start very briefly with George Washington, uh, because Washington is known for his uh, 110 rules of civility that he wrote out when he was a very young man. And Washington didn't come up with these himself. Rather, he was drawing on a host of literature that preceded him and is all based upon Erasmus' book, which was called On Civility in Children. And children is, I think, uh, the operative word because we're all children at heart and sometimes we behave like them. Uh, and so of the 110 rules that Washington wrote, uh, 14 of them actually referred to activities at the table. And they include things like feed not with greediness, keep fingers clean, and when foul, wipe upon the corner of a table napkin. It was uh, a concern that if you, if you, if you weren't be able to behave in the proper manner, you wouldn't be seen to be a gentleman of good breeding. And this was extremely important to him, in part because he, he was not a man of great means when he started out in life. He actually married up, and having good manners undoubtedly was a, a good help to him. So um, what we see here is one of the first uh, uh, pieces of silver that he ordered for his home. And this is actually before his marriage to Martha Custis. Uh, he sent to London for two best sets of silver handles and knives. These actually carry the Washington crest, which of course, you know, in, in, a, in an America without uh, tra such trappings means he had these aspirations to gentility. And these would have been used for dessert, for candied fruit or sweet meats and such. Um, and it simply proves that he had this intention to provide these kind of accoutrements to his guests and demonstrate his own abilities as a man of, of good breeding. Uh, but you know, as, as we know, these kinds of tools are also means of exclusion and inclusion. If you know how to use them, you're a part of one group. If you don't, well, you might belong in another one. And in that other group, you one might put... <laughs> Uh, this is uh, George, uh, Prince of Wales, heir to the British throne, not behaving very well, uh, showing how things can be if you are uncontrolled and uh, self-indulgent. He's, uh, he's picking his teeth with a meat fork, 
And uh, he is uh, also, of course, grossly overweight, and his, there's a slop bowl behind him. It's all rather nasty. Uh, and and uh, it is referring back, I mean, this whole concept of the fork is an important one in America because um, it, was a, it was actually very late in the 19th century when the fork really came into use. The Italians are credited with uh, using the fork first, and there is a, a wonderful quote about the Italians who cannot endure to have their dish touched with fingers, seeing that they are not alike clean. And, and this use of the fork, of course, is a means of, of distancing yourself from the meat uh, at hand. And what, what started as a large meat fork ended up as an individual fork and began that process of creating a certain separation and a performance in how one manages one's tools. So um, for those who are in need of help, and I certainly would count myself among them, uh, there was all kinds of pre prescriptive literature available. These are just three, but in a very short period of time, um, there were something like 200 books on uh, manners and proper behavior between about uh, 1870 and 1900. And that's just the published book, because it's not talking about you know, any magazines or any other kinds of smaller pamphlets and literature. So uh, clearly, there was a market for it, and uh, plenty of writers willing to, to help out. And uh, part of the reason this growth appears is because Washington's world is gradually coming to an end. Uh, he was part of this you know, early landed gentry, people who could you know, count their generations back. And what happens beginning in the early 19th century is that there's new immigrants coming in, the, the world is changing, fortunes are being made through industrialization. These are new people, new money, what do they know? And so they have to find out by checking books like these. Um, it was really a, considered a pathway to, uh, to, to, to wealth and influence if you knew how to properly manipulate such materials. And uh, here we see um, this lovely, lovely painting by William Henry Lippincott of infantry in arms, a beautiful uh, scene of the home, a uh, beautiful dining room with the mother, her children, and a maid looking after things. And it's this concentration of the dining room, the home, and motherhood that really is where this activity takes place. And it's just, it's kind of the idealized uh, dining room that one, one thinks about uh, when, when considering what, what that beautiful home uh, might look like. The, f the women were at this time considered to be the moral center of the home. That was their sphere of influence. And in fact, they sort of took it on as a kind of a sacred center of the home. And so that indeed is where all kinds of activities took place. It was kind of a pageant of, uh, of behavior. Uh, and uh, looking forward you know, to the 20th century, you think about you know, bringing, bringing someone home to meet your parents, guess who's coming home to dinner, and who is watching what exactly he's doing at the, at the kitchen table. Uh, that's all coming back from, from this, uh, this time period. And the, the control over that space uh, going, moving forward. The control over that space, the administration of that space, uh, was considered really the, um, the, the domain of women. And the idea was to produce children who would then co continue that and, and be great members of society. Well, I was, I was telling you uh, about how um, every, every good child should be raised properly so that when they become an adult, they behave correctly. However, if you were to look at this image, you would wonder whether any of them had, had learned anything as children. Uh, this took place, this image is uh, taken by, uh, drawn by Thomas Nast after the inauguration of Ulysses S. Grant. And after the inauguration, there was a ball, and at a certain point in the evening, a buffet was announced, whereupon everyone just dashed into the room and immediately began throwing themselves at the food. And I hope you can see, if I can maybe pick out a few of them, I better not touch anything. Um, <laughs> But there's, especially on the right-hand side, there are people who are grabbing at the food. It's all falling down to the floor. There's a fellow crouching over to the left on his haunches, eating, and then lots of people holding their plates up high. So you can imagine a good deal of food was spilled, and maybe fingers were used, which is not very appropriate. But anyway, we, di we digress. We digress. So, uh, but a, a good, proper uh, bride-to-be 
would be thinking very hard about all the things she would need to have to, to construct this, this moral home. And of course, that moral home is a, is, a, is a home of aspiration, and aspiration leads to consumption. So here we have a bevy of uh, bridal gifts, and this is something that was typically found uh, in the 19th century if a bride was married. Uh, certainly, it's, it's true in New York, and I'm sure in a lot of other metropolitan areas. When the bride uh, was married, there would be a separate room set aside for the showing of the gifts. So these wouldn't have been wrapped, but rather they would be out and shown. Shown. And oftentimes, you read in the papers uh, lists upon lists of all of the different gifts that brides would have uh, received at the wedding. And here we see a, an old dowager, uh, perhaps her grandmother, who knows, or a nosy neighbor, uh, <laughs> checking out all the little baubles and goodies that she got. And among them, uh, just uh, to, the, to the right of the, of the bride-to-be, who's sort of center with the locket, uh, is, an, is an early, what looks to be one of something old. It's, a, it's an old caster, at least it's in that form. But there are lots of other shiny things there. And it, it's simply here to sort of give you a sense of all the expectations and the acquisitions that would be part of that uh, new bride's uh, trousseau go into her, her new life. And uh, for those who were well-to-do, like the Ferbers, in this case, this, this is the Angelo service, uh, there's the, just a multiplicity of things to choose from. And as you saw upstairs so brilliantly uh, staged in the exhibition, the, the number of different forms one had to choose from, simply mind-boggling. And I myself never try to identify all the, all the forms because I know I'm going to be wrong. Uh, but I just uh, think this is a lovely illustration of some of the, the main forms. And, uh, and then this uh, more 20th century image of an advertisement of a, of a bride just dreaming of that kind of wooden box just filled with all those marvelous pieces that will make her, her home complete. So uh, this kind of complete home was one that was built a bit on a fantasy, uh, kind of a nostalgic look backwards. When were, when were manners really really well done. They were done, better done in the past, and we are trying to improve upon them in the present. So uh, in a whole number of brochures and publications produced by Gorham, one finds all these allusions to past glories and uh, stylistic forms that vaguely allude to the periods in question. So here's one example, and I think this is uh, the tankard that David pointed out to us earlier on the right side of the page. But this, this is a, a layout for, the, uh, for ancient and medieval England. And they have lots of flowery script about that period of time. Uh, down below, there are uh, servers carrying trays of, of steaming food for, for the big banquet table. And then a few examples of actual Gorham pieces. So you sort of put yourself in that, in that space. And similarly, uh, John, um, John Holbrook, as we heard before, was interested in sort of purifying certain styles and working with these historical forms. And uh, he produced a wonderful book called uh, Silver for the Dining Room, in which about 10 or 12 different periods are uh, explained in text and then illustrated with uh, images like these, which are evocations of historical styles. In this case, this is uh, one of the Louis XV period. And uh, again, they're placing you inside the room. And on the tabletop are objects that are very much like the Gorham pieces that are offered for sale. They're not delineated here, but you can sort of see, see which ones they are. And then on the, on the opposite side of the page is the Chantilly pattern, which they were pairing. So this is like, if your ideal is Louis XV, well, then this is the pattern for you. So that makes, makes the choice very easy. And similarly, just to give you some samples of the different other, other sorts of publications they produce, they're all very beautiful, really handsomely produced, high quality. And I think you know, they're also appealing to a customer who is looking for quality. So the publications themselves carry that kind of uh, value as well. So uh, here, Versailles, uh, the Mythologique, as we've seen uh, from earlier today, and then uh, the Imperial Chrysanthemum of 1906, and even just shows you that you know more than 25 years after the Philadelphia Exposition, Japanese design is still a very much a, a desirable one. 
So once you have all your flatware, then how are you going to deploy it in your, in your dining room? And there are two choices. Uh, the first one is a la Francaise, and uh, the design on the, on the left here from the middle of the 18th century shows you the, the traditional pattern of doing a very bilaterally symmetrical design, and all the, the food is laid out uh, along with the plates. And everyone is intended to sit through several courses. They would sit together, all the food would be laid out, and the food passed along. Dangerous, I agree. Uh, <laughs> Um, in this case, there's a lot of work that's being done at the table by the diners, and then the, the staff would come and remove those, those pieces and return with the next course. Sometimes this would take as many as three hours, and many got rather tired in the process. Then, uh, in the uh, earlier part of the 19th century, uh, through uh, influence from Russia, there was this uh, uh, different service called A la Russe, and uh, this is a, a good example of that. And I'm just showing you here uh, the, uh, the candelabra from, uh, from the exhibition and how they do relate to some of these larger pieces in the center. This is a different approach. The silver, much of the silver is kept on the sideboard or in the kitchen. The center of the table is filled not with food, but with beautiful examples of silver or perhaps floral uh, uh, compositions. And the service is brought around by staff. So they're successive servants coming and they would have done all the carving of the meat in the kitchen and they would simply bring it to you and you would choose from the plate but they would go on kind of like it's, a lot of it is is done today this was considered to be more elegant but it's also much more costly in the end because you need more servants to conduct the work uh, and um, and you also need lots more dishes for all of this going around and oftentimes there could be in certain homes as many as 14 courses it would be a lot for me and of course, all those servants were sometimes difficult to find. So I'm uh, showing you here just a couple of images. On the left is a photograph from historic New England of a servant who is uh, just about disappearing to the left. And he's carrying a small tray, which is difficult to see. In fact, servants were difficult to see. There are very few images of them around, in fact. And, uh, but I thought this was a good one because of the time period. And, and then on the right, this is an illustration from the New Cyclopedia of Domestic Economy from the 1870s. And here's a little uh, um, Goldilocks girl on the right with her parents all being served by an African-American uh, servant. But in fact, they were difficult to find. And with successive waves of immigration, of course, the Irish were one of the chief ones, Irish, German, Dutch, what have you. Uh, but then many of them did not like to stay because their, their role in the household was often very inferior and they were often given much more work to do than they thought proper. So uh, whenever they could, they left to find better opportunities. But then um, there are also new forms to add to the dinner table. And here I show you celery, celery. Celery was produced in great quantity in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And what does Kalamazoo, Michigan have to do with anywhere else in the United States? Well, trains. In the antebellum period, uh, sorry, after the Civil War, uh, lots and lots of trains had been put in place, be partly because of the war and because of expansion afterwards. So these trains made all kinds of new foods more accessible to, for consumption and really radically changed the look of the American table. So uh, in the case of Kalamazoo, these are pictures from about 1900. And by this time, there were about uh, 30 or 40 different uh, growers in the city. But they knew they could get their sellers onto ice-packed railroad cars where they could be taken off to their ver various destinations. And of course, for every special food, there is an object to serve that food. And so I offer you the celery vase uh, in glass that was produced by the, uh, the New England Glass Company. But of course, also right here at the exhibition is a beautiful celery vase, because in the 70s, the celery was shown vertically. So they were almost like as if they were uh, flowers. Uh, and, uh, and then later, around 1900, they then flop on their side and they're served in trays. But I, I like these better. And then there's uh, oysters. Now, oysters had been eaten here by Native Americans for probably centuries. 
And uh, all along the eastern seaboard, they were easy to find. Oysters were one of the greatest uh, uh, products of the, of the harbors, uh, the harbor around New York City, one of the, one of the greatest locations for oysters. Uh, but the other thing that really made them more popular, more widely popular across the country, was the possibility of canning. And canning really, really, um, we think of canning and, uh, and maybe 50s, uh, you know, the, that kind of era. But in fact, canning came into use, wide use, before the 20th century, starting in like the 1860s. And oysters was one of those products that received uh, very, uh, very heavy use. Uh, one image I don't have here to show you, but there is a mag really what a magnificent example in the galleries, is of a great big gilded turtle on tray. And oysters uh, were great, but let me tell you, turtles were the, really the top of the, the heap, so to speak. Um, John Adams ate turtle soup a couple of days after the Declaration of Independence was signed. Uh, Lincoln enjoyed them at his second inaugural ball. And the terrapin was used widely and sought after. And Maryland was one of the best locations to obtain them. Unfortunately, they were essentially uh, sought and hunted out of existence, which is why turtle soup essentially just disappears by the turn of the century. And then, uh, curiously, salad. You know, we think of salad today as such an ordinary thing, everybody should have salad. But one thinks, if one thinks back in the 19th century, where refrigeration was still uncertain, uh, you were really subject to the vagaries of the seasons. If it was in season, you had it. If it wasn't in season, you weren't going to have any. But the same issue of refrigerated cars, train travel, made all of this much different. And Gorham produced, among, among its many publications, uh, at least one salad book. And once gotten on the, on the topic, uh, you could make um, uh, salads with all manner of food. It was just you know, a little bit of lettuce, but it added to the concept of what you can do, and of course, the, the proper implements to serve them. One more is uh, the sardine. Now, sardines, uh, because of their name, are considered an exotic food. However, they were also uh, found in the United States, and they were popular uh, for among many, many people and considered a, a delicacy in their own right. They, too, were canned up in, up in Maine, in fact. And they often came in boxes like these. This is an early example of one. Uh, this is uh, from the 1860s. They often had a glass lining, and they would have been served with little tongs. Of course, Gorham went one step further, and this is in the, in the Ferber service, and there's a darling little sardine wiggling on the end of, of these servers. The same is true for ice. Uh, ice had been harvested in the north in blocks, shipped south for a uh, long time, but it was difficult to maintain the ice in one's home. With time, uh, there was this new discovery, uh, this new invention of the ice box. And with the ice box, one could retain ice and you could keep objects in your home longer. So when they arrived from some far off location, you could bring it home and even keep it for a while. It allowed for you know, greater planning and all of that for, uh, for, um, for meals. And of course, if you were having a really elegant dinner, how nice for you to have a fabulous bowl to show it off in. And, uh, and to serve it with the proper tongs. And these have little harpoon handles uh, with, wrapped with cord. Uh, we heard about the, um, the caribou at the top and these bears at the bottom really dripping with ice. And it still was a very exciting thing at this point to have fabulous ice on view in your home. And this just made the spectacle all the more grand. As you were reaching the end of your time uh, at dinner, you would have uh, fruit plates, these also from the Ferber set. And if you needed a little more ice, this fabulous hatchet here <laughs> would definitely do the job. Uh, but as the, as the, the meal ended, uh, there would be fruit. And uh, this is a fantastic 
a fruit server that came up at auction in January, which I personally desired. So I had to include it uh, in this uh, display today. And uh, nutcrackers uh, for various nuts that would be perhaps shown in the fruit dishes or, or elsewhere. And it was uh, said in the literature that uh, at the end of the meal, the ladies would retreat, the men would enjoy the fruit and the nuts and discuss the social economy and politics and such. So this was also their domain, as was uh, other things. You could have a, your, your coffee urn. This is a, um, a now lost painting by Louis Mora from 1900, and it shows his wife and her, and, uh, her family seated around a coffee urn in a more informal <laughs> setting. Uh, one can imagine this would have been as popular as having it on a big dining table. And we do have to remember that um, all of these prescriptive literatures having to do with proper displays were shown at the, the umpteenth level of sophistication and execution. And reality was somewhere along this line, not, not often quite to the same degree. So this would have been a more informal kind of a treatment of, and use of a really uh, elegant uh, coffee urn. But also, the men would have their opportunities to enjoy uh, cigars together. And there are just so many wonderful examples in the Gorham collection of the, in terms of the range of uh, match safes that are available, these tiny little uh, cigar lighters, all these elements added to the, the luxury of the space and the surrounds in which these gentlemen would array themselves. And of course, they would be brandy snifters, carafes, and such to enhance the conversation. Lest we forget, we must always remember the children. And so for tiny hands, Gorham was very, very happily and, and busily uh, letting everyone know that they could purchase uh, new examples of silver for their loved one or the children of their loved ones. And uh, there was a whole array, as you can see here, from little tiny uh, uh, spoons with loops to loop around your little finger, uh, to food pushers, to bowls and cups. Uh, the whole array was available. And this started in the 1870s and 80s. Uh, this one's from 1924. But of course, the tradition uh, continues to this day. And many drawings also survive. This is one by Eric Magnuson. I, now I learned how to pronounce it, too. Uh, from 1928. So this, the tradition perhaps uh, faltered a bit as time went on, but it did, it did continue. Now, one form that is not often discussed, but which really saw a, quite a fluorescence of interest was the chafing, book, chafing dish. And there are unbelievable number of publications on the chafing dish around the turn of the century. And I see it as a, a change in social behavior and perhaps a yearning to set aside some of this great formality that we've witnessed thus far. Uh, the chafing dish and the materials in it came about at the um, uh, the Waldorf Astoria, it said, that's the apocryphal story anyway, as an after-dinner meal. People coming back from the theater in need of something to eat, and the Welsh rare, rare bit was born, which had something like cream and cream cheese and mustard and beer and a few other mushy things on toast. And this was deemed to be very delightful. And uh, in fact, it spawned a whole number of new publications. And in fact, the other interesting thing is that it was posed as something that both men and women could do. It was something you could do if you lived alone, if you were uh, a tired housewife and you needed a pick-me-up at the end of the day. If you were a bachelor, you could have, a, have this. And it really sort of turns out to be like the little, little Bunsen burner you might have you know, in a, in a one-room apartment. The, this this uh, form did many kinds of, of duty. And here we have just a couple of later illustrations of women uh, in the uh, 40s uh, continuing to use it. And they look uh, perhaps a little uncomfortable. But it, it was a spectacle, <laughs> it, because that was part of it. It was really the, the, the showing of this wonderful attitude toward this improvisational style of eating. But women were beginning to go into the workplace, as were servants. 
and uh, refrigeration and other kinds of appliances changed attitudes toward what one does at home, how much one entertains, and times, in fact, did change. We heard from David Barquist about this wonderful, uh, these wonderful designs by Eric Magnuson, but they did fail to meet a real audience. And the, the, what happened as time went on is fewer and fewer families were buying large amounts of table settings. They were opting for smaller sets. And in fact, life was just getting a lot more complicated. And I show you here this wonderful photo from the late 40s of a father and mother juggling two children, trying to, to get their, their children off you know, in, the, in the morning. The wife is sitting in the back with an egg beater trying to get, get breakfast done. And it was because of these kinds of families and the challenges they faced that the guide to easier living was born. And that proposed that there is a much simpler way of living and living graciously and living with good manners and with politeness. And in that, uh, I'll just skip this because I see a sign out there. Uh, they, the, the whole concept was that there would be this, um, this new style host and new style hostess, and furthermore, a new style guest. And in this new style world, all of them came together to make for a wonderful event. And that is really the story of the potluck dinner, frankly, <laughs> truly. So, uh, so here we have just one, one illustration from that book, which shows people, perhaps they're a little resigned to their fate. They maybe would rather have servants helping them. But in fact, they are proceeding in a very, very mannered, orderly fashion. Uh, to have their, their, their turn at the buffet table. Well, they've, it's come a long time from Henry Sargent's dinner party, where there were these elegantly attired uh, butlers attending to everyone's needs, and perhaps there's something lost there, but I would say a lot has been found in the equanimity among, and good fellowship that you could find in eating together. So I would say, in, in conclusion, enjoy your silver and enjoy your friends. <laughs> <laughs>